Well, Steve, this brings you back to your old stomping ground here, doesn't it? Yes, I got my PhD here in 1993. Uh, Hebrew Union was founded in the 19th century, and in fact, it's 140 years old this year. Mm. Uh, I came here to study the Semitic languages so I could understand the Old Testament better and study the many Semitic languages and other languages as well. It's a well-kept secret. I don't let anybody know how many languages I studied. Sounds like uh, a lot. Huh? Oh yeah, it was a lot. Uh, Aramaic, Hebrew, Akkadian, Ugaritic, Phoenician, and on and on, the way it goes. So it make you a, a Hebraist? I am a Hebraist, that's right. It was a wonderful experience here. A Hebrew Union, and this is the place I live, basically. This is the Clow Library. The library, huh? Oh, yeah. Uh, at the time, it was 600,000 volumes. I think it's bigger now. This is really interesting. Uh, this is from 1524. Uh, it's called the Second Rabbinic Bible. The custom was to name books after the first word of the text. So the first word in Genesis is Breshit. Genesis 1 1 is Breshit bara Elohim et Hashemayim ve Haaretz. So Breshit is the first word um, and it means in the beginning. Okay. Mm-hmm. So this is from 1524. Yeah. What's interesting about this is uh, it's a rabbinic Bible. So we have the text is in the middle section. And then here we have Rashi's commentary. Uh-huh. Rashi. Uh, and uh, over here we have Ibn Ezra's commentary. So, this, so is, this is a commentary. The, yeah, the commentary. And uh, whether you can notice or not, but this is a different script. This is called Rashi script. He invented a script. So you not only had to learn all these languages, you had to also understand the different scripts. Oh, the different with scripts. Them as well. Yeah, yeah. Steve, what else do we have here? I mean, these are fascinating uh, documents. And well, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is from, um, I was told this is from Germany. Now, I'm going to go back just so you can see the beginning of it. Uh, you can see the, these, are, these are old, okay? So here we've got, uh, this is, um, this, again, this is the word breishit, and you can see that mm-hmm. this is you know, pretty beat up. Yeah. So if we move it very carefully, uh, here is, and here is the, uh, this is the beginning of the Toledot of, uh, of Noah. No. And it says, Ele Toledot Noah, Noah Ish, Tzadik, and so forth, and it's, um, these are Toledot. Now, the interesting, that word Toledot is a very interesting word. Uh, it's from the Hebrew word Yalad, to give birth. It's translated sometimes genealogy, sometimes it's translated um, history. And uh, it's always actually the story of the descendants. So the Toledot of Noah is, it's not that much about Noah. In fact, Noah doesn't really say anything in the flood narrative. Uh, un- he doesn't say anything mm-hmm. until, uh, until the incident with Ham later. Yes. Uh, and the first thing that Noah says is a curse. <laughs> Amazingly enough, uh, but uh, the, the word Toledot, uh, Genesis is built around that. It begins with uh, Genesis 1-1, right here, Brei Sheet, uh, and uh, Genesis 1-1 through 2-3 is a kind of a preface or a prologue to the book, and then there are 11 sections, uh, and each of them begin with the word Toledot, they just begin with the word Toledot. So we've got, uh, here it is, this is the Toledot of Noah, and what follows then is the account of the flood. Mm-hmm. This is, this is a Samaritan Pentateuch. I don't, can you see that Samaritan Pentateuch? Heavy, heavy lifting weights. Okay, so uh, Samaritan Pentateuch, and um, see, this is a different script. Mm-hmm. You can see it. Uh, it's a little more of a cursive. Uh, the Samaritans, the only part of the Old Testament that they accept as, as their scripture is, um, is the Pentateuch. But this is actually in the Samaritan script, and it's, it's pretty, uh, it's, it's amazing. So let me, let me close this up. Okay. And uh, I'm going to take really good care of these things. And now let's go to, this is a facsimile. This is, um, this is the Leningrad Codex, lovingly known as L. <laughs> uh-huh. uh, the uh, original of this uh, is in, uh, the reason why it's called the Leningrad Codex, it's in the public library in St. Petersburg, in Leningrad, right. okay? It's on the shelf B19A. You can actually go into the public library and find this there. Uh, this is a facsimile okay. of it. Mm-hmm. The, the thing about the um, Leningrad Codex, it is the uh, oldest complete codex. It's from 1009 okay. AD. But what it says here, I am Ani Shmuel Yaakov Ben Yaakov. I am Samuel, a son of Jacob. And then he says, I, I wrote it and I copied it. And the, the thing about the Leningrad Codex, uh, he, fo- he followed 
uh, an exemplar of uh, Ben Asher. Ben Asher is the premier uh, Masoret, but this is the oldest complete manuscript, and all scholarly Hebrew Bibles are based on the Leningrad Codex. Wow. wow. Well, Steve, what, what are the oldest documents that we have here? Okay, how about uh, going from, we, here we have 11th century, 10th century, these are both A.D. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got something here from the 2nd century B.C. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, it's just a little fragment, and it's Dead Sea Scrolls, and uh, it is the, from Cave 6. Let's, let's sit down and take a look at okay. this. And this is from um, Cave 6 at Qumran. It's a cave six. Cave six. All the Qumran manuscripts are designated by the cave in which they're found. The most famous manuscript is 1Q Isaiah A. Uh, that means it was found in the uh, first cave. This is from cave six. Hmm. Uh, and uh, there's not a lot of Genesis uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The only book that's not represented at all in the biblical material is Esther. Th these are actually different. Uh, oh, I these, see. these are okay. different uh, uh, texts. Mm -hmm. uh, and the interesting thing about this, this what I'm showing you right here, uh, is that it is, uh, it's not written in the regular Dead Sea Scroll script. For, for whatever reason, they wrote it in uh, a Paleo-Hebrew type script. So it's actually called 6Q Paleo-Hebrew Genesis. Uh, and so the Q stands for Qumran. But this is a section, that's, there's not much of Genesis, but it turns out that this section here comes from uh, comes from the flood narrative. And uh, so, yeah, we can actually see this, but it's, uh, it's giving the details of the, of the size of the ark and various different things like that. Well, and and, and um, this is 2nd century B.C., 2nd century B.C., and the text is virtually identical in, these, in this 10th century uh, and 11th century manuscripts. Of, so 1,200 years later, we have the same mm -hmm. text. It's absolutely, it's, it just shows the reliability and how accurately it was, it was copied yeah. from 2nd century B.C. to, uh, yeah. to 11th century A.D. Yeah. Uh, Steve, that just um, overwhelms me again to, to think uh, that we have, we have a document, the Bible, that has been so preserved over so many years. Is there any other no, uh, I don't, I don't. book in, in history that has, has that kind of accuracy and, and, and so many documents? No, no, I don't think so, I don't think so. And, and also all the, with all the efforts to destroy it. Mm -hmm. And they, it, we still have it, we still have all these old manuscripts and we have these things, the Dead Sea Scrolls, these were found in jars, you know, in, in large clay jars uh, in the Dead Sea, mm -hmm. and there's thousands of those yeah. jars. Steve, it seems in all the things that we've been looking at and pointing to that there is a lot of history in the Bible. Is that how you see it? Is oh, absolutely. In fact, uh, the, 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 the way to look at uh, biblical narrative, but not just narrative, but poetry as well, is to recognize it as a, as a threefold aspect. Uh, and I think the problem with evangelicals is they haven't understood uh, that all three things are true of the Bible. And the first thing is that it's an accurate historical account, mm -hmm. okay? And not only that, that accurate historical account is portrayed in such a way I, I call it a magisterial literary presentation. Uh, and it is, uh, and the combination of the magisterial literary pr presentation of the uh, accurate historical account ends up in producing a foundational theological treatise. Mm -hmm. So it has those three aspects. And there are a lot of false dichotomies out there, people saying, well, if it's historical, then it can't be literary. If it's literary, it can't be historical. If it's theological, it cannot be historical, and so forth. So those, those six false dichotomies. And those, those, those come actually from a Jewish scholar by the name of Meir Sternberg. Uh, he didn't call it theological literature, he called it ideological literature. But he understood that the Bible is literary. It's, mm -hmm. In fact, he said it's literature. He didn't, even, mm -hmm. he, he, he didn't even say that literary was good enough. He said it's, it's literature. It actually is literature, and you study it that way mm -hmm. uh, and understand uh, his book is The Poetics of Biblical um, uh, Narrative, uh, Ideological Literature, and the Drama mm -hmm. of Reading. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful, and you can then see uh, how the, the literary portrayal brings things out, yeah. uh, like, like the way in Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3, the way in which 
the material is presented as, and it's, it's a clear polemic against the other creation accounts that were in existence mm -hmm. in the ancient Near East. It presents uh, the sun in Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3, the sun is just the sun. It's just a, something that God created. Whereas the, in the ancient Near East, the sun is a vicious, capricious god mm -hmm. of judgment mm -hmm. of the day. And the moon is a capricious god of judgment of the night. That's why it says in Psalm 121, the, the sun shall not smite you by day or the moon mm -hmm. by night. It's not talking about sunburn and moonstroke. Mm -hmm. It's talking about uh, the idea of these ancient Near Eastern gods. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we find in Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3 that they're not even named. And because they're not named, they don't have any, um, they can't be sentient. Uh -huh. Because in the ancient, in ancient Near East, name is not just what, what, what a name is for us. It is, it is the essence of something. Yes. It's, their, it's the attribute, it's the essence, not just a label. So in the, in the names of God, they were just not names. They were pointing to His nature. And, exactly. And his yeah, Yahweh is, is, yeah. Is, is, is pointing to the fact that He's yeah. the self-existent yeah. one. Steve, when, when you say one of those characteristics, the first one you mentioned is that the Bible is accurate history. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we know, all of us uh, have known for a long time that the history of the Bible has been under severe attack. Right. And, and yet it appears that um, archaeology is again and again confirming that that history is true. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that what you mean by saying it's accurate history? The, the presentation is such, uh, and, and the perspective of the writers, that they believe they were talking about real events. Okay. It's, very, it's very obvious that because of the way in which uh, they in, insist that the next generation learn, you know, learn mm -hmm. their history, they set things up in monuments so the, so the next generation uh, will remember what mm -hmm. happened here. Like, for instance, the crossing of the Jordan and things like that. The authors will actually say to their readers, they'll say, uh, like, for instance, in Joshua, he'll say, you can see that today. Mm -hmm. Now, wh why would you say that as an author? Now, you can see that. You, you can see the pile of stones we put over uh, mm -hmm. Achan and his family uh, because of his sin. You can go there if you want to today. You can dig through that pile and find the skeletons mm -hmm. down there. Mm -hmm. Why would you do that if you knew it wasn't true? Right. So I mean, it, was written, the... uh, it was written uh, in a manner that said, this is true history. Oh yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, it's, 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 it, there's other things too. There's, there's, there are like footnotes. Uh, there, are, there are comments by the author of little details which would be very interesting to the author as a historian. Mm -hmm. uh, he'll give you know, d d d details, uh, they'll give dates. Uh, and even in the, the flood narrative, that's the, when the first dates are given. There's five fixed dates that are involved uh, with the flood yeah. narrative. Uh, sources are mentioned. Historical scholars today uh, will, will give their sources. Mm -hmm. So we, we find out what the sources yeah. of kings are and so forth. Well, the sources are given. Well, Steve, let me ask you some questions here as you're going through this. And Absolutely. Because uh, these are questions that I hear all the time. Okay. I hear them from my students as well. And okay. um, the first thing is, is well, you're talking about days here. Do you see these as literal days? Is that what the text is telling us? Or you know what other people think, that the, this is just a poetic, uh, different well, kind of Well, first of, of all, it's, it's not poetry. If this is narrative, what I call, what, what I refer to this text, uh, it's, an ordinary, it's an ordinary Hebrew narrative text mm -hmm. with extraordinary content. What that means is that the, you should understand the words, the, way, the normal way in which those Hebrew words okay. are understood. The word yom, it means day. Can it mean by extension, uh, just like in English, uh, you know, David's day, uh, indefinite period of time? However, the, 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 uh, the foundation of its usage is what we mean by a day. It's a 24-hour day. And I know that word has been uh, pulled out a lot. Uh, it seems to me what you're saying here is that if you just pull the word yom out, and, and try to make it something else, you, you're also losing the fact that it's in this context exactly. of, of the historical narrative. Right. It's, Yom here is, uh, it's, it's clearly just, uh, it just means a day. The only way you'd want it to mean a lo longer period of time is if, is if you impose an alien concept, a hermeneutical concept to the text mm -hmm. and say, well, I think that, that these are ages and therefore Yom has to mean ages. What you have to, what we have to always do is start with the text. Yeah. If we start with the text, yom means day. 
Well, we were just uh, talking to Paul earlier. We were talking about these paradigms and, and mm -hmm. how powerful those are. Is that what you're referring to, that someone has a different paradigm uh, and then therefore trying to read the text into that paradigm? Yeah, and as a result, they also say that, it, I mean, Old Earth um, uh, evangelicals, what they'll say is that this text is, uh, is poetic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a mythical poetic text that teaches truth, but it's not, it does not represent what it appears to be representing. And what I'm saying is a Hebraist, and um, I'm not saying when the world's greatest Hebraist in any, in any sense, but the world's greatest Hebraist all affirm that this is a narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they, they say that that's one of the unique features uh, of the Genesis accounts of creation and the flood is that they are narratives because in the ancient Near East, they are done in mm. epic poetry, uh, which is very different. And here we have narrative to indicate that this is historical. Uh, the ancient Near Eastern accounts are, are so different with Tiamat being this monstrous serpent goddess who wants to devour Marduk, all this kind of stuff, and he calls the winds in to fill her up and she blows up and then he, he takes her carcass and makes the universe yeah. out of it. That's so different what we have here. God saying, Yehi or, mm. let light be, and Vihi or, and light was. So it's just so different, uh, so, so different here. Well, that's a, that's a powerful thing uh, that you said that uh, all Hebraists look at this and understand this is historical narrative. Oh, yeah. So when we come to uh, the passage that talks about uh, the creation of, of Adam and mm -hmm. Eve, yeah. um, you're seeing that as a clear historical event which would stand in direct opposition to the, to the conventional paradigm that's taught everywhere that Adam and, and Eve evolved out of a long, long process. The biblical text is not compatible with the standard, mm -hmm. uh, the conventional paradigm. Uh, you cannot, you can't put the two together. Uh, you can't do it. And my research is showing that this is actually a historical narrative means that they, they can't do it. It's, it's not poetry. It's, it's not, it's not um, mm -hmm. uh, statistically admissible. Well, Steve, this is interesting to me because you not only see this as a Hebraist, linguistically, mm -hmm. as historical narrative, but you have done scientific research uh, to also show that it is. Tell me more about that. Now, it was with an ICR-sponsored project um, called the RATE Project, which stands for Radioisotopes and the Age of the Earth. And they let this uh, Hebraist in with, this, with all of the <laughs> geologists and physicists, these yeah. brilliant geologists and physicists. And, but what I wanted to do was uh, to uh, quantify uh, people, as I say, Hebraists, they know intuitively mm -hmm. that it is narrative, uh, but can we prove it? Can we, can, yes. can we do it uh, uh, mathematically or statistically? So what I, uh, what I did was I worked with a, uh, two statisticians. I counted the number of a particular verb type called a viactol. It forms the backbone of Hebrew narrative, okay? And so I counted the number in uh, all of the passages. I went through all the passages of the Hebrew Old Testament. I identified which passages were uh, they considered to be a, a narrative, which were poetry. Uh, and then uh, the statistician, uh, he picked random, random number generator, which, which ones I would analyze. Mm -hmm. I counted the number of, uh, of viactols uh, in each passage, and we showed statistically that uh, as you moved from poetry to narrative, that the, the number of viactols went way up to like ab above 50%. And the other direction, it was down 4% or something like that. And then my question is, could you use this uh, in some way to predict, based upon the number of viatoles, whether a passage was poetry or narrative? We did it at a 99.5% uh, uh, confidence level. Um, but it turned out that the, the difference between narrative and poetry is so great that the, the band of all the possible logistic regression curves is very actually quite narrow. Oh. And as a result, looking just at Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3, the probability that it is narrative is between 0.999942 and 0.999987. Oh. So that's, you know, so, so that means it is, that's narrative. And then once you realize that the biblical narrators also believed it was history uh, and presented it as history, mm -hmm. and then we believe, as Mayor Sternberg, who's Jewish, recognizes that. Uh, he's, he pointed out, he says, you know, you Christians uh, believe in inspiration. And so if the authors of the Bible are 
believe that they are writing real history and presenting us real history, then mm -hmm. uh, as believers' inspiration, you must believe mm -hmm. that it's real history. Yeah. Well, Steve, help me understand here and help people understand that this, Genesis 1 through 11 has become very contentious. Yeah. And walk through this, what are these contention points and why? Well, obviously Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3 uh, is uh, creation um, by God, direct creation uh, in six days. Is there something meaningful in that? Well, this, the six days of creation followed by the day in which the Lord hallowed that special day, the Sabbath day, so it's seven days. And uh, what's interesting is that a year is based upon the movement of the earth around the sun. Uh, a month is basically the lunar periods. But the week uh, that we organize, really the way of, of we organize our life is based on the fact that God created the six days mm -hmm. and then we have a day of that day off. I mean, if we, if we never had a day off uh, ever, we would be in big, big trouble. Mm -hmm. But can you imagine uh, um, organizing your life on the basis of the month no, or I mean, the year? No. But, but, but the Lord knew that the week was the perfect way to do it. And we're told in, in Exodus 20, uh, verses 8 through 11, uh, that the reason for the Sabbath was to remember that He had created the earth in six days. Mm -hmm. Uh, then we're, we're told uh, elsewhere, also in, in, the, in, the, in the tabernacle um, legislation, that He created the earth in six days. This is very important. To, that's re something's repeated uh, you know, several times uh, of the, that the Lord had created in six days. Now, He could have created instantaneously, uh, but He chose to do it this way. I, th I think for our for us.